Hello and welcome to Represent NYC. Um, again, I'm Victoria Burt and I'm the producer of this show and we're doing the show out of my home. And I wanted to touch on today a topic that I think is vitally important to talk about and it's domestic violence and the um, danger that comes with being an, uh, it on pause and in your home uh, 24 seven or more than normal. Um, if you're experiencing um, some form of domestic violence. Um, joining me now from Safe Horizon is Maureen Curtis, and Maureen is the Vice President of Criminal Justice Programs for that organization. Hi, Maureen, how are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Um, tell me, if you can, just what Safe Horizons is and how it works. Well, Safe Horizon is the largest victim services agency in the country. Um, we work with all victims of crime, so whether you're a victim of domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, or a victim of robbery, stranger assault, burglary, you can come to any one of our um, many programs and receive assistance that includes uh, client-centered client -centered trauma-informed services. We help people um, where they're at, uh, do, we do safety assessments uh, and safety planning that includes uh, talking about options and services that may be available for them. Um, and we have lots of programs. We work in courts, in police precincts, in the community. We run the three um, hotlines, a domestic violence hotline, a rape sexual assault hotline, and a um, crime victim hotline. Uh, we have about 50% of the New York City domestic violence shelter beds are run by Safe Horizon. We run child advocacy centers. Um, we work with homeless runaway youth. And then we have specific programs that work with specific populations such as um, our domestic violence law project, our immigration law project, our anti-trafficking program. Um, so basically any need any victim of a crime has, they can come to one of our programs and we'll help them. So during this, time of the coronavirus and people are in quarantine. It, this is obviously a more dangerous time for somebody who um, is being victimized in their home, mm -hmm. correct? Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, one of the tactics that uh, abusers often use is isolation. They isolate a person mm -hmm. from family, friends, coworkers. Um, so now to be told to stay home, where you're isolated with that person can definitely uh, lead to whether it be escalated physical violence or even emotional or psychological uh, violence. So I wanna to touch on something that I think is interesting that we shouldn't just think about this danger or this time as dangerous that is gonna end when the uh, quarantine, as it were, the that we're no longer on pause when that ends and the ripple effect that it will have. You think that, that we will see an increase in domestic violence in general? Yes, because I think that while um, loss of job, um, other stresses in a person's life does not cause domestic violence, but it definitely has an impact and can exacerbate um, violence in the home. What kind of, um, changes in the 911 calls have you seen? Is there been an increase or a decrease? And is the response time changing because of what we're experiencing now in New York? So the police are still responding to 911 calls. Um, we have heard that there has been a slight drop in 911 calls for domestic violence, um, but the police are still responding and um, helping victims who may feel the need to call 911. Um, our shelters are still open and our hotline is still operating 24 hours, seven days a week. Are there beds available now for people? Yes, yes there are beds available. So we run nine shelters, um, about 750 beds in those shelters citywide. And there are other agencies that, that also operate domestic violence shelters in New York City. And they're still accepting survivors and their children into shelter. What kind of um, concerns should they have about the COVID virus and going into a shelter? Or um, will they experience any kind of pushback from hospitals if they need to call or go to the hospital? Are you seeing anything like that happening? We have not heard stories where the hospital is not allowing them to be admitted if their injuries are um, severe. Survivors make decisions 
all the time that um, will that weighs their risk about what next steps that they want to take in order to keep themselves safe. So a person may decide that at this time um, going into shelter is the best option for them, even though they may be concerned about going into a shared living space, but they're more concerned about the threat of physical violence. If let's say somebody is afraid and they make the phone call and they call safe horizons, what happens if they say, I want to get out, what happens? Well, if they say they want to get out, then the advocate would do their assessment that they normally do on the hotline. They're also going to talk a little bit about what it means to go into shelter. It's confidential, but if they um, learn that um, it's shared space or maybe they speak another language and very few people at the shelter speak their language, that all of this is explored with that person so that they are informed about what shelter life is like so that they can make an informed, educated decision. And if at the end of that, they decide that they want shelter, the hotline then is going to help them um, access shelter. Now, have there been any changes to how the process works because people are working remotely, people are working from home, um, as far as working with your organization, like let's say if, they're, if, they're need to, if they need to get something like an order of protection, has, has, how has that changed or has so that it? That has changed where um, now that the courts are all operating remotely, a person who wants to petition for an order of protection can do it remotely. Um, they can even do it on their own if they want um, by calling the number that's um, available for the court. But it can be a, um, an onerous process. So our advocates who, um, this is what they do mainly in the family court program um, day to day where they help a person uh, petition online for an order of protection. They are now doing it remotely. And in addition to helping them do that, we can also safety plan with that person around what it means to now have that order of protection. How is it going to be served and, and what's going to happen when that person is served and, you know, to, to talk about how they're going to keep themselves safe and also you know, if they need to enforce it, what it means to enforce that order of protection. Tell me and tell anybody who might be listening the different ways that they can get in touch. The hotline is yes. the main, which is okay. 24 hours, seven days a week. They can go on our website, www.safehorizon.org. Our safe chat, which is a way through the, the um, website that a person can chat safely with an advocate and you also provide services in, in Spanish, correct? Do you have any other languages? That's correct. That's correct. Yes, we have sp staff that speak up to 17 different languages. Can people donate to Safe Horizons? Yes, uh, Safe Horizon and programs like ours are going to need money to um, help survivors. You know, and that and that help could be, you know, giving them a target card so they're able to go out shopping. If they come into court and they have no money for themselves or their children, um, food vouchers so that they can go to a local um, place and have something to eat while they're waiting to go back to court in the afternoon. So even little things like that are so critical to help survivors. Maureen, thank you so much. I really, um, I'm grateful for what you're doing and I thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you very okay. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.